Welcome to Nottingham. With me is Dr Richard Bell, a colleague in the department, and he is going to address the question of Arthur Schopenhauer and the world. You're welcome, Richard. Thank you, Tom. Um, well, Arthur Schopenhauer was a German philosopher born in uh, 1788, died in 1860. And he was a philosopher who took a very keen interest in science, like his uh, mentor, Immanuel Kant. And in fact, when uh, Schopenhauer went to university, uh, he was then 21 years old, he initially enrolled for medicine and he took a number of courses in the sciences before moving over to philosophy. Now, his main work is called The World as Will and Representation, and this says quite a lot. So, there are two ways of looking at the world. First of all, you can look at it in terms of representation. So, representation, this is where the human subject is imposing space, time, and causation upon experience. It's what Immanuel Kant would call the appearance, the erscheinung. And so Schopenhauer said on the one hand, you can look at the world as representation. And in, you, in most everyday experience, this is how we experience the world. This is how we experience the world, for example, also in the physics laboratory. There is, so to speak, a certain subject-object correlation. But he said you can also look at the world in another sense, and you look at that in terms of will. Now, he used the term will because he understood the world in analogy to the human person. So he said if you look at the human person, you can look at the human body, and you could also look at the will. And he said that these are two sides of the same coin and he would say that the will is manifest in the body. And then he extended this, and he said, well, if the human body can be a manifestation of the human will, perhaps the world as representation is a manifestation of the world will. So he had this idea that you can look at the world not only in terms of Vorstellung, that's representation, but also in terms of will. And the will corresponds to Kant's thing in itself. Now, if I can just try and illustrate this idea of the thing in itself, because I think it's very important to get uh, a, a hold of this. Um, if you wanted to know the thing in itself, let's say the chair I'm sitting on, if I wanted to be acquainted with the chair in itself, I'd have to view it from no particular spatial position. I'd have to view it in a timeless way. I couldn't use any human concepts. I couldn't use any language like French, German, Chinese, serbo croat or whatever. And the philosopher Geoffrey Warnock has put it rather nicely. He said, to be acquainted with a thing in itself, you don't ac actually have to be God, because only God can perceive something from no spatial, no temporal position and so on. And so this is the, uh, the difficulty that human beings have with experiencing the thing in itself. And so Schopenhauer said it's almost as though there is a veil over this ultimate, ultimate reality. So the thing that we usually experience is the world as representation, not the thing in itself. Now, this has actually got some very interesting implications. Because if you take the work done in a physics laboratory or chemistry laboratory, you're actually dealing with the world as representation. So, you're not, not, so according to Schopenhauer, you're not actually dealing with the fundamental levels of reality. And so this means that in scientific work, you're almost looking at the surface. You're not actually dealing with the ultimate depths of reality. And this puts a big question mark against the philosophy of materialism because according to Schopenhauer matter itself is quite a mystery. We actually form this world as representation. Now this might actually sound as though it's been rather insulting to scientists saying that we're only dealing with surface reality. 
But the interesting thing is, is that after Schopenhauer, a number of scientists actually took a deep interest in his work. And two figures are Erwin Schrödinger and Albert Einstein. And Erwin Schrödinger was one of the, 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 the key people to actually um, establish quantum theory, in particular quantum mechanics. So Erwin Schrödinger was a great fan of Schopenhauer, as was Einstein. Uh, and in fact, sometimes when Einstein would write his prose, he'd even write it in the style of Schopenhauer. Although one has to say Einstein himself, I think, had real questions about Schopenhauer's philosophy. So, although according to Schopenhauer, science is simply dealing with surface reality, scientists have been very attracted to his philosophy. And there's some very interesting things in quantum theory, which in a way chime in with what Schopenhauer was getting at and what Kant was getting at as well. Because if you think about it, Schopenhauer is talking about this world as representation, where we have space, time and causation, and then the world as will. This is the thing in itself. And in a way, that sort of corresponds, only sort of corresponds to what's happening in quantum theory. Because in quantum theory, what do we perceive? We perceive events. But when people do the formulation of quantum theory, they're using a mathematical function. And it's almost as though the mathematical function roughly corresponds to the thing in itself. And the events we observe correspond to the world of phenomena. Now, there are one or two problems with this, because according to Kant and Schopenhauer, we are actually imposing causation upon our experience. But of course, in quantum theory, we actually observe random things. So there's a little bit of a problem there. But just to close, I'd just actually like to mention a thought experiment, the einstein podolsky rosen thought experiment. And this is very, very interesting, because in one formulation of this, you have a particle of spin zero, which then decays. And then you get two particles with spins in opposite directions. And when you actually look very, very closely at this, one way of interpreting this is that this particle over here and the particle over here somehow know what each of them are actually up to. And it's this thing called non-locality, or some people, sometimes people talk about entanglement. And what is fascinating about Schopenhauer is, is, is that he says, when you move from the world of phenomena where things seem to be spatially separated, and you move down into the world of the thing in itself, the world as will, everything becomes one amorphous mass. Because he said that in the world as will, there is no principle of individuation, because in the world as will, there's no space, time, or causation. Richard, thank you very much.